Welcome to Van's reading. We're on chapter 29, The Fourfold Pattern for Thinking and uh, for Thinking Fast and Slow by Donald Kahneman. So here we go. Whenever you form a global evaluation of a complex object, a car you may buy, your son-in-law or an uncertain situation, you assign weights to its characteristics. This is simply a cumbersome way of saying that some characteristics influence your assessment more than others do. The weighting occurs whether or not you're aware of it. It is an operation of system one. Your overall evaluation of a, of a car may put more or less weight on a gas economy comfort or appearance. Your judgment of your son-in-law may depend more or less on how rich or handsome or reliable he is. Similarly, an assessment of an uncertain prospect assigned weights to the possible outcomes. The weight or certainty correlates with the probabilities of these outcomes. A 50% chance to win a million is much more attractive than a 1% chance to win the same amount. The assignment of weights is sometimes conscious and deliberate. Most often, however, you are just an observer to a global evaluation that your system one delivers. Changing chances. One reason for the popularity of the gambling metaphor in the study of decision making is that it provides a natural rule for the assignment of weights to the outcomes of a prospect. The more probable an outcome, the more weight it should give, uh, which, uh, the more weight it should have. The expected value of a gamble is the average of its outcomes, each weighted by its probability. For example, the expected value of 20% chance to win 1,000 and 75% chance to win 75% chance to win $100 is $275. In the pre-Bernoulli days, gambles were assessed by the expected value. Bernoulli's retained this me method for assigning weights to the outcomes, which is known as the expectation, expectation principle, but applied it to psychological value of outcomes. The utility of gamble in his theory is the average of the utilities of its outcomes, each weighted by its probability. The expectation principle does not correctly describe how you think about the probability related to risky, pro risky prospects. In the four examples below, your chances of receiving $1 million improved by 5% in the, or 5%. Is the news equally good in each case? <clears throat> so there's one, four examples. So example A is from 0 to 5%, from 5% to 10%, from 60 to 65%, from 95 to 100%. So they're saying in the four examples below, your chances of receiving $1 million improved by 5%. Is the news equally good in each case? So yes, every time there's a rise, in the first two cases, you're like, no, well, that's not great. But then the next case, where it's from C to D, where it goes 60 to 65, from 95 to 9, you kind of feel like your expectation is like you have a better luck. Uh, the expectation principle asserts that your utility increases in each case by exactly 5% of the utility of receiving $1 million. Does this prediction describe your experience? Of course not. Everyone agrees that 0 to 5% and 95 to 100% are more impressive than either 5 to 10% or 60 to 65%. Increasing the chances from 0 to 5 transforms the situation, creating possibility that did not exist earlier. A hope of winning the prize. It is qualitative change where 5 to 10% is only a quantitative improvement. The change from 5 to 10% doubles the probability of winning. But there is general agreement that the psychological value of the prospect does not double. It stays, it stays about the same. The large impact of 0 to 5% illus illustrates the possibility effect, which causes highly unlikely outcomes to be weighted disproportionately more than they deserve. People who buy lottery tickets in vast amounts showed themselves willing to pay much more than expected value for a very small chance to win a large prize. The improvement from 95 to 100% is another qualitative change that has a large impact the certainty effect. The certainty effect. Outcomes that are almost certain are given less weight than probability justifies. To appreciate the certainty effect, imagine that you inherit one million dollars, but your greedy stepsister has consisted the will in court. The decision is expected tomorrow. Your lawyer assures you that you have a strong case and that you have a ninety percent, ninety-five percent chance to win. But he takes pains to remind you that judicial decisions are never perfectly predictable. Now you're approached by a risky ad adjustment company, which offers you to buy your case for nine hundred ten thousand dollars outright, take it or leave it. The offer is lower by forty thousand dollars than the expected value of waiting for the judgment, which is nine hundred fifty thousand dollars, but are you quite sure you would want to reject it? 
That's an interesting thing. So like you could get a kit. I never knew you could buy cases. That's interesting. If such an event actually happens in your life, you should know that a large industry of struct structured settlement exists to provide certainty at a hefty price by taking advantage of the certainty effect. Possibly and certain and certainty have so possibility sorry possibility and certainty have similarly powerful effects in the domain of losses. When a loved one is wheeled into surgery, a five percent risk that an amputation will be necessary is very bad much more than half as bad as 10% risk because of the possibility effect, we tend to overweight small risks and are willing to pay far more than expected value to eliminate them altogether. The psychological difference between 95% risk of disaster and the, and the uh, certainty of a disaster appears to be even greater. The silver of hope that everything could still be okay looms very large. That is actually a good point. So if the, the worst situation occurs, the more we don't like risk at all. So if there's oh there's only a ten percent ten percent chance of uh, of this happening, and that's actually interesting, and then we don't like that. Whereas like oh there's only a ten percent chance of you winning the lottery or one percent chance of that. It doesn't sound too um, too uh, what's the word? What's the word? It doesn't too to us. It doesn't sound fun at all to do. Whereas, you know, as, as he keeps on saying that negative things are of more of a priority than positive things. So it keeps on coming up. Overweighting of small probabilities increase the attractiveness of both gambles and insurance policies. The conclusion is straightforward. The decision weight that people assign to outcomes are not identical to the probabilities of these outcomes. Yeah. Contrary to the expectation principle, Improbable outcomes are overweighted. This is the possibility effect. Outcomes that are almost certain are underweighted relative to the actual certainty. The expectation principle by which values are weighted by their probability is poor psychology. Psychology. And the plot thickens, however, because there is a powerful argument that a decision maker who wishes to be rational must conform to the expectation principle. This was the main point of the axiomatic version of utility theory that von Neumann and Morgenstern, Morgenstern introduced in 1944. They proved that any weighting of uncertain outcomes that is not strictly proportional to probability leads to inconsistencies and other disasters. The derivation of the expectation principle from axioms of rational choice was immediately recognized as a monumental achievement which placed expected utility theory at the core of the rational agent model in economics and other social sciences 30 years Later, when Amos introduced me to their work, he presented as an object of aware. He also introduced me to a famous challenge to the theory, to that theory. Alias's paradox. In 1952, a few years after the publication of von Neumann and Morgenstern's theory, a meeting was convinced in Paris to discuss the economics of the risk. Many of the most renowned economists of this time were in attendance. The American guests included the future Nobel, Luke, or Laureate, Nobel laureates Paul Samuelson, Kenneth Arrow, I think it's Laureates, Laureates maybe, I don't know, Laureates, I'm guessing it's Laureates, Kenneth Arrow and M Milton Friedman, as well as the leading statistician Jimmy Savage. One of the organizers of the Paris meeting was Maurice Alice, Maurice Ali or something, it could be one of those. Maurice, I think this is a French name, but Maurice Ali, Ali, Maurice Ali, who would also receive a Nobel Prize some years later. Ali had something up his sleeve, a couple of questions on choice that he presented to his distinguished audience. In the terms of this chapter, Ali intended to show that his guests were susceptible to a certainty effect and therefore violated expected utility theory and the axioms of rational choice on which that theory rests. The following set of choices is a simplified version of the puzzle that LA constructed in problems A and B, which would you choose? A, 61% chance to win $520,000 or 63% chance to win $500,000. 98% chance to win $520,000 or 100% chance to win $500,000. Obviously the certainty ones, duh. If you're like most other people, you prefer the left-hand option in problem A, duh, and you prefer the right-hand option in problem B, yeah. If these were your preferences, you have just committed a logical sin and violated the rules of rational choice. The illustrious economists assembled in Paris committed similar sins in a more involved version of the alias paradox, 
or early products, depending. I'm going to say at least now. To see why these choices are problematic, imagine that the outcome will be, be will be determined by a blind draw from an urn that contains 100 marbles. You you win if you draw a red marble. You lose if you draw a white. And if, in problem A, almost everybody prefers the left hand urn, although it has fewer winning red marbles because the difference in the size of the prize is more impressive than the difference in the chances of winning. And probably in, in problem B, a large majority chooses the urn that guarantees a gain of $500,000. Furthermore, people are comfortable with both choices until they are led through the logic of the problem. Compare the two problems and you will see that the two urns problem, problem B are more favorable versions of the urns of problem A. With 37 white marbles replaced by red winning marbles in each urn, this improvement on the left is clearly su superior to the improvement on the right. <laughs> Yo, sorry, guys. <coughs> ah, sneeze. Since each red marbles gives you a chance to win $520,000 on the left and only on $500,000 on the right, so you started in the first problem with A, a preference for the left hand urn, which was then improved more than the right hand urn, but now you like the one on the right. This pattern of choice does not make logical sense, but a psychological explanation is readily available the certainty effect is at work the two percent difference between a hundred percent and a 98 percent chance to win in a problem b is vastly more impressive than the same difference between 63 and 61 percent in a problem a as alias had anticipated the sophisticated participants at the meeting did not notice that their preferences violated utility theory until he drew their attention to the fact that the meeting was about to end Alice or LS, whatever it had intended, that this announcement to be a bombshell, the leading decision theorists in the world have preferences that were inconsistent with their own view of rationality. He apparently believed that his audience would be persuaded to give up the approach that he rather contemptuous, uh, contemptuously labeled the American school and adopt an alternative logic of choice that he had developed. He was to be sorely disappointed. Economists who were not aficionados of decision theory mostly ignore the alias problem. As often happens when a theory that has been widely adopted and found useful is challenged, they noted the problem as an anomaly and continued using expected utility theory as if nothing had happened. In contrast, decision theorists, a mixed collection of statisticians, economists, philosophers, and psychologists took alias challenge very seriously. When Amos and I began our work, one of our initial goals was to develop a satisfactory psychological account of Ailey's paradox. Most decision theorists, notably including Ailey's, and maintained their belief in human rationality and tried to bend rules of rational choice to make the Ailey's pattern permissible. Over the years, there have been multiple attempts to find a plausible justification for the certainty effect, none very convincing. Amos had a little patience for these efforts. He called the theorists who tried to rationalize violations of utility theory lawyers for the misguided. We went in another direction. We retained utility theory as a logic of rational choice, but abandoned the idea that people are perfectly rational choosers. We took on the task of developing a psychological theory that would describe the choices people make regardless of whether they are rational. In prospect theory, decisions weights would not be identical to probabilities. Many years after we published Prospect Theory, Amos and I carried out a study in which measured the decision weights that explained people's preferences for gambles with modest monetary stakes. The estimates for gains are shown in Table 4. So there's a table. Let me just put it on the camera here. And maybe I can click back that. Let's see what happens. All right. And basically, there's probability and decision weight. So there's zero, one, and then it goes up to 100% probability, and then the decision weight, which goes up in fives, threes, and um, tens, etc. So it goes zero, so probability to one to 5.5, two to 8.1, five uh, percent would be 13.2, 10 to, eight, to 18.6, and 22, and so on. It goes up to 100, it doesn't matter. You can see that decision weights are identical to the corresponding probabilities at the extreme, both equal to zero when the outcome is impossible and both equal to 100 when the outcome is a sure thing. However, decision weights depart sharply from prob probabilities near these points. At the low end, we find the possibility effect. Unlikely events are considerably overweighted. For example, the decision weight that corresponds to a 2% chance is 8.1. 
If people conform to the axioms of rational choice, the decision weight would be 2. So the ray event is overweighted by a factor of 4. The certainty effect at the other end of the probability scale is even is even more striking. A 2% risk of not winning the price reduces the utility of gamble by 13% from 100 to 87.1%. To appreciate the asymmetry between the possibility effect and the certainty effect, imagine first that you have a 1% chance to win $1 million. You will know the outcome tomorrow. Now imagine that you were almost certain to win $1 million, but there is a 1% chance that you will not. Again, you will learn the outcome tomorrow. The anxiety of the second situation appears to be more salient than the hope in the first. The certainty effect is also striking, also more striking than the possibility effect of the outcome is a surgical disaster rather than a financial game. Compare the intensity with which you focus on the faint silver of hope in an operation that is almost certain to be fatal, uh, fatal compared to the fear of a 1% risk. The combination of the certainty effect and possibility effects at the two ends of the probability scale is inevitably accompanied by inadequate sensitivity to in intermediate probabilities. You can see that the range of probabilities between 5 and 95% is associated with a much smaller range of decision weights from 13.2 to 79.3, about two-thirds as much as rationality expected. Neuroscientists have confirmed that these observations, finding regions of the brain that respond to changes in the probability of winning a prize, the brain's response to a variation of probabilities is strikingly similar to the decision weights estimated from choices. Probabilities that are extremely low or high below 1% or above 99% are a special case. It is difficult to assign a unique decision weight to very rare events because they are sometimes ignored or altogether effectively assigned a decision weight of zero. On the other hand, when you do not ignore, they are very rare events. You will certainly overweight them. Most of us spend very little time worrying about nuclear meltdowns or fantasizing about a large inheritance from unknown relatives. However, when an unlikely event becomes the focus of attention, we will assign it much more weight than its probabil probability deserves. Furthermore, people are almost completely insensitive to variations of risk among small uh, uh, sorry. <clears throat> so furthermore, people are almost completely insensitive to variations of risk among small probabilities. A cancer risk of 0.001% is not easily distinguished from a risk of 0.00001%, although the former would translate to 3,000 cancers for the population of the United States and the latter to 30. Yes, so that's an interesting fact that, you know, people tend to get a little bit like oh i have a sense of loss here that if, I, if there's any type of loss here then like we are very we're very uh what's the word resistant when it comes to trying to win something or trying to get something etc and it's very interesting because that's all just off it's a fatal flaw or it's you know it's also like the idea of like the the idea of risk because defining let's say you want to go up to a person and it doesn't you know some you want to go up to a person maybe sell a product and um you know sorry i got distracted by my brother uh you want to sell a product to a person now the first thing usually people get rejected in the beginning saying oh sorry the, the you know this doesn't work out but the reason why people get rejected most most of the time is when they're selling is because they're selling to the wrong person someone is not like let's say you're selling perfume they're not it that person that you got rejected by is not looking for perfume they're looking for something else right now because that's what life has led them to and so there is prospects in the world where there are people who want to buy a perfume but maybe that person is not looking for perfume at that time or maybe not in the situational, or maybe not influenced to. And yes, you can influence the person to buy perfume within that specific time frame or environment, but it takes a lot of effort to do that, and it's not, you know, not very efficient. You want to sell multiple items in a in a specific time frame rather than one person, and that's the goal. So yeah, when you pay attention, so I'm going to continue. Uh, when you pay attention to a threat, you worry and the decision weights reflect how much you worry because of the possibility effect. The worry is not proportional to the probability of the, of the threat. Reducing or mitigating the risk is not adequate. To eliminate the worry, the probability must be 
brought down to zero. The question below is adapted from a study of the rationality of consumer valuations of health risk, which was published by a team of economists in the 1980s. The survey was addressed to parents of small children. Suppose that you currently use an insect spray that costs you $10 per bottle and it results in 15 inhal inhalation poisonings and 15 child poisonings for every 10,000 bottles of insect spray that are used. You learn of a more expensive insecticide that reduces each of the risks to five for every 10,000 bottles. How much would you be willing to pay for it? Uh, the parents were willing to pay an additional 2.38 on average to reduce the risk by two thirds from $15 per 10,000 bottles to five. They were willing to pay $8.09, more than three times as much to eliminate it completely. Other questions showed that parents treated the two risks, inhalation and child poisoning as separate worries and were willing to pay a certainty prim premium for the complete eliminations of either one. This premium is compatible with the psychology of worry, but it's not with the rational model. The fourfold pattern, when Amos and I began our work on prospect theory, when I'm, I'm this man, we quickly reached to go on two conclusions. People attach values to gains and losses rather than wealth, and the decision weights that they assign to outcomes are different from probability. Neither, neither idea was completely new, but in the combination, they explained a distinctive pattern of preferences that we called the fourfold pattern. The name has stuck. The scenarios are illustrated below. Gains, <clears throat> losses, high probability, certain T effect. Just get, I'm just wanted to quickly. I want to go tell this asshole to go away, but you can't. Uh, gains, losses, high probability, certain T effect. Ninety-five percent chance to win ten thousand dollars. Fear of disappointment, risk averse, accept unfavorable sentiment, losses. 95% chance to lose $10,000, hope to avoid, so, okay, basically they're showing us this table. Um, it's basically a gains and loss table versus a high probability certainty effect and a low probability possibility, possibility effect. So the first row is gains and it says 95%, this is a high probability certainty effect. 95% 95 chance to win $10,000 fear of disappointment, risk averse, and accept unfavorable settlement. 5% chance to, this is the low probability possibility effect, which is 5% chance to win $10,000, hope of a large gain, risk seeking, reject favorable settlement. Losses with high probability certainty effect is 95% chance to lose $10,000, hope to avoid loss. Risk seeking reject favorable settlement, 5% chance to lose $10,000, fear of locked loss, risk averse, accept unfavorable settlement. The top row in each cell shows an illustrative prospect. The second row characterizes the focal emotion that the prospect evokes. The third row indicates how most people have behaved when offered uh, a choice between a gamble and a sure gain or loss that corresponds to its expected value. For example, between 95% chance to win $10,000 and $9,500 with certainty. Choices are said to be risk averse if the sure thing is preferred, risk seeking if the gamble is preferred. The fourth row describes the expected attitudes of a defendant and a plaintiff as they discuss a settlement of civil suit. The fourfold pattern of preferences is considered one of the core achievements of prospect theory. Three of the four cells are familiar. The four top right was now was new and unexpected. The top left is that one that Bernini discussed. People are averse to the risk when they consider prospects with a substantial chance to achieve a large gain. They are willing to accept less than the expected value of a gamble to lock in, sure, in a sure gain. The possibility effect in the bottom left cells explains why lotteries are popular. When the top prize is very large, ticket buyers appear indifferent to the fact that their chance of winning is minuscule. A lottery, a lottery ticket is the ultimate example of the possibility effect. Without a ticket, you cannot win. With a ticket, you have a chance. And whether the chance is tiny or merely small matters little. Of course, what people acquire with a ticket is more than a chance to win. Is the right to dream pleasant, pleasantly of winning. Ouch. So I've been saying in a couple of past videos, if you don't buy the uh, a ticket, you can't win the lotto. Now, that's I think this is the point that they're making here. It's like, well, I mean, if you have a 95% chance, you do it. Uh, but uh, also, five, five, if you have a 5% chance, then obviously, you're not just buying a 
chance to win, but you're buying the right to dream pleasantly of winning. The bottom right cell is where insurance is bought. People are willing to pay much more for insurance than expected value, which is how insurance companies cover their costs and make their profits. Here again, people buy more than protection against an unlikely disaster. They eliminate a worry and purchase peace of mind. Give me a second. I want to quickly close. Just. Bro. Bro, 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 bro. This guy needs to turn that volume down. Okay, he's not for some reason every time. I'm gonna just wait for him to make a noise and I'll just send a message. The results of the top right saw initially surprised us. We were accustomed to think in terms of risk aversion except for the bottom left saw, where lotteries are preferred when we looked at our choices for bad options. We quickly realized that we were just a risk, we were just as risk seeking in the domain of losses as we were risk averse in the domain of gains. We were not first to observe risk seeking with negative prospects. At least two authors had reported that fact, but they had not made much of it. However, we were fortunate to have a framework that made the finding of risks, risk seeking easy to interpret. And that was a milestone, milestone in our thinking. Indeed, we identified two reasons for this effect. First, there is a diminishing sensitivity. The sure loss is very aversive because the reaction to a loss of $900 is more than 90% as intense as the reaction to a loss of $1,000. Just give me a second, guys. I just want to close the door. I'm getting really frustrated. Second, just a second. I'm so happy now. That felt great. Okay, um, so... The second factor may be even more powerful. The decision's weight that corresponds to a probability of 90% is only about 71, much lower than the probability. The result is, the result is that when you consider a choice between a sure loss and a gamble with a high probability of a larger loss, diminishing sensitivity makes the sure loss more aversive and the certainty effect reduces the aversiveness of the gamble. The same two factors enhance the attractiveness of a sure thing and reduce the attractiveness of the gamble when the outcomes are positive. The shape of the value function and the decision weights both contribute to the pattern observed in the top row of table 13. In the bottom row, however, the two factors operate in opposite directions. Diminishing sensitivity continues to favor risk aversion for gains and risk seeking for losses, but the overweighting of low probabilities overcome the effect and produces the observed pattern of gambling for gains and caution for losses. Many a fortunate human situations unfold in top right cell. This is where people who face very bad options take desperate gambles, accepting a high probability of making things worse in exchange for a small hope of avoiding a large loss. Risks taking of this kind often turns manageable failures into disasters. Uh, the thought of accepting the large share loss is too painful and the hope of complete relief too enticing to make the sensible decision that it is time to cut one's losses. This is where businesses that are losing ground to a superior technology waste their remaining assets in futile attempts to catch up. Because defeat is so difficult to accept, the losing side in wars often fight long past the point at which the victory of the other side is certain and only a matter of time. Gambling in the shadow of the law, the legal scholar Chris Guthrie has offered a, a compelling application of the fourfold pattern to two situations in which the plaintiff and the defendant is in a civil suit consider a possible settlement. The situation differ in the strength of a plaintiff's case. As in scenario we saw earlier, you are the plaintiff in a civil suit in which you have made a claim for a large sum in damages. The trial is going very well and your lawyer cities expert opinion that you have a 95% chance to win outright. But as the caution, you never really know the outcome until the jury comes in. Your lawyer urges you to accept a settlement in which you might get only 90% of your claim. You're in the top left cell of the fourfold pattern and the question on your mind is, am I willing to take even a small chance of getting nothing at all? Even 90% of the claim is a great deal of money. And I can walk away with it now. Two emotions are evoked, both driving the same direction, the attraction of sure and substantial gain and the fear of intense disappointment and regret if you reject a settlement and lose in court. You can feel the pressure that typically leads to cautious behavior in this situation. The plaintiff with a strong case is likely to be risk averse. 
Now steps in the shoes of the defendant in the same case, although you have not completely given up hope of decision in your favor, you realize that the trial is going poorly. The plaintiff's lawyer have proposed a settlement in which you would have to pay 90% of the original claim and it's very clear that they will not accept less. Well, you settle or will you pursue the case because you face, as high, you face a high probability of loss. Your situation belongs to the top right side. The temptation to fight on, on this is strong. The settlement that the plaintiff has offered is almost as painful as, as the worst outcome you face and there's still hope of prevailing in court. Here again, two emotions are involved. The sure loss is repugnant and the possibility of winning in court is highly attractive. Fact, a defendant with a weak case is likely to be risk-seeking prepared to gamble rather than accept a very unfavorable settlement. Fact, in the face-off between a risk-averse plaintiff and a risk-seeking defendant, the defendant holds the stronger hand. The superior bargaining position of the defendant should be perfected in negotiated settlements with the plaintiff settling for less than so the, 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 oh my God. the statistically uh, expected outcome of the trial. This prediction from the fourfold pattern was confirmed by experiments conducted with law students and practicing judges and also by an analysis by analyza, oh, I don't know this word by an analyzes of actual negotiations in the shadow of civil trials trials now consider frivolous litigation when a plaintiff with a flimsy case file a large claim that is most likely to fail in court both sides are aware of the probabilities and both know that in a negotiated settlement, the plaintiff will get only a small fraction of the amount of the claim. The negotiations is conducted in the bottom row of the fourfold pattern. The plaintiff is in the left-hand side with a small chance to win a very large amount. The, uh, the frivolous claim is a lottery ticket for a large pr price. Overweighting the small chance of success is a natural in this situation, leading the plaintiff to be bold and aggressive in the negotiation. For the defendant, the suit is new, new science. I think it's a nuisance with a small risk of very bad outcome. Overweighting the small chance of a large loss favors risk aversion and settling and settling for a modest amount is equivalent to purchasing insurance against the unlikely event of a bad verdict. The shoe is now on the other foot. The, plant, the plaintiff is willing to gamble and the defendant wants to be safe. Plaintiffs with the frivolous claims are likely to obtain a more generous settlement than the statistics of the situation justify. The decisions described by the fourfold pattern are not obviously unreasonable. You can emphasize in each case with the feelings of the plaintiff and defendant that lead them to adopt a combative or an accommodating posture. In the long run, however, deviations from expected value are likely to be costly. Consider the large organization, the City of New York, and suppose it faces 200 frivolous suits each year, each with a 5% chance to cost the city one million dollars. Suppose further that in each case that the city could, uh, in each case the city could settle the lawsuit for a payment of a hundred thousand dollars. The city considers two alternative policies that will apply to all such cases: settle or go to trial. For simplicity, I ignore legal cost. If the city litigates all two hundred cases, it will lose ten for a total loss of ten million dollars. If the city settles every case for a hundred thousand dollars, its total loss will be twenty million. When you take the long view of many similar decisions, you can see that paying a premium to avoid a small risk of a large loss is costly. A similar analysis applies to each of the cells of the fourfold pattern. System, system, oh my God. System, ah, systematic deviations from expected value are costly in the long run and the rules apply to both risk aversion and the risk seeking. Consistent overweighting of improbable outcomes, a future of intuitive decision making eventually leads to inferior outcomes. Speaking of the fourfold pattern, he is tempted to settle this frivolous claim to avoid a free clause. However, unlikely that overweighting of small probabilities, since he is likely to face many similar problems, he would be better off not yielding. We never let our vacations hang on a last minute deal. We're willing to pay a lot for certainty. They will not cut their losses so long as their chance of breaking even. This is a risk seeking in the losses. They know the risk of a gas explosion is minuscule, but they want it mitigated. It's a possibility effect and they want peace of mind. So, the, uh, I think the main idea here is basically just compare the, the way we react to, to bad news and that no matter what, when you have bad news, like we automatically go to, we got to find something. And even though it's a risk, we got to perform this action in order to prevent 
this bad news or negative uh, outcome from happening to us. And so that is the other thing, because as we know, it's our flight or, uh, flight or fight response, and therefore we are fighting to find a better situation. And I think that's an interesting concept because that shows you how we as people tend to survive in every aspect, of, in any manner, no matter what, uh, we all try and survive. <laughs> Facts. You know, it's all game. So but, well, the question is, what about the people who get unlucky? Well, they're just unlucky, it seems. But that doesn't mean... But like there is an example of where you buy the ticket, you don't have a chance to win the lotto. So it's like that type of, you know, um, that type of uh, scenario. And we also have to ask ourselves, yes, the lucky people will get, get to sit on the top. And then we think about the poor people, etc. And, you know, it's it, it, it's a tough... It's a tough, 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 tough topic. But I st even though, you know, they're at the bottom and they don't have the correct... In maybe my uh, my assumption of why people are generally poor, like, yeah, obviously they became unlucky when they became, you know, they got born and now they're in an unlucky environment and then they followed the choices of their predecessors and therefore uh, they do the same thing and they create a habitual uh, pat a pattern that they live their lives and they you know they keep on doing the same thing but it is a breakable pattern once you put them in a in a different environment where you could create a different habit and so it's an interesting uh dynamic where he keeps on talking about how the, the our innate our innate motivation will always be to survive and survive any threat that is out there before we look for any increase of survival of increasing our survival state so every time we want to be here at this part we never want to go up or down because you know i would be wasting quite a bit of energy to get to that and it requires a lot generally speaking you motivate yourself slowly to get it but we will always stay here in order to prevent, you know, uh, prevent the, the negative, uh, negative scenarios from happening to us. And we will, we'll, we'll, we'll cause, we'll use more energy to stay here to prevent anything from happening from here to, for us to go here. Okay, now I'm just moving my hands in all that sort of place. What I'm trying to say is we use a lot of energy to stay here. And we try to keep ourselves up here instead of going down here. And that requires quite a bit, a bit of energy and it will become number one priority energy. Uh, I think that's an interesting thing because you're trying to stay constant in life as we should to survive. And that our brain automatically says, okay, this is a great state. Stay here until <laughs> something bad happens. Then move or stay here and fix the problem from happening. And I think that's the whole point of the chapter of chapter 29. Anyway. I don't want to go in circles here, but uh, yeah, great chapter. Uh, it's a little bit repetitive. They keep on bringing up the same concept of how we kind of actually view things every time, the uncertainty, and we prefer certainty over, over uncertainty, and it's a natural biological state that we always prefer the certainty st uh, state. Um, yeah, it's a tough dilemma because you're trying to unprogram yourself from doing those types of things to get the better solution but there is risk involved in it but with risk like like in like that i've learned in my because i studied finance had a financial degree and what they've always taught us high risk high reward medium risk medium reward low risk low reward and that's how life is generally speaking and yeah but my point is if you are a person out there who has an issue with money or i mean i'm i'm okay i'm not great but my perspective on that is that you got to find a new environment create a different habitual place and make sure you're in a place where you can win and that's the game um but yeah so that's my that's my cup of tea right there okay guys thanks for watching um please leave your comments and ideas and thoughts below it's a great place to debate on these ideas and thoughts maybe you have better you know explanations etc and yeah thanks for watching comment below and like and subscribe cheers bye